Hey everybody, it's Josh Barrows here. Today for this episode, what I wanted to talk about, I really wanted to get into the uh, the business model. How, like, I know a lot of people who are trying to pursue wealth, they, and, and there are a few opportunities in their area, so the next logical conclusion is to start up a business. And while um, the, I, I, what I really want to get into is what I've learned about this topic, what um, some of the things that I learned that are best to steer away from, and the reasons why. And a lot of it has to do with experience, you know. And I wouldn't, I'm not, uh, um, I have good reason. I'll bring up all the reasons why I, I'm against certain, certain things and why I, um, I prefer other different things that you could do if you're wanting to increase your money. If you want to do it like right now, you know, if you're really, really hurting for money, if you have like a, you're on the verge of financial ruin or collapse or something. Starting a business is not it's not the best thing for you to do. And and I don't want to lose people right away by saying that. I hope my hope is that you if you are in that position that you can um, you can mitigate whatever risk you would be getting into because there's there is risk with starting a business you can you can shrink those risks which I'm going to get into but any business that you start up is always risk there's risk that it's not going to work so you definitely want to take that in mind and if you need money now um, there are better ways of getting that money and I'm going to do another video on that topic so that you can um, so basically if you're in that situation I can I can give you some things that have that I've seen worked and if and when I have been in that situation will have worked for me as well. But this episode here, I'm going to assume that you are legitimately interested in pursuing something you're passionate about, you know. Um, maybe maybe you do want money, but you don't have to have it like right now. If you have to have money right now, um, don't listen to those marketer guys. Don't listen to the pickaxe salesman. They they just want your money, okay? So they're going to tell you what you want to hear so that you buy what you want from them, what you want them to give you. So they're going to tell you that. You're going to buy. If that's what you want, they're going to sell it to you, and then it's going to be up to you to make it happen. You know, so that's, that's a, the uh, pattern that I've seen with these. When you... When somebody says, oh yeah, you can make a ton of money, um, you can do it within the flash, within like um, a moment, just at the last moment when it's vital to your survival, it can hit your account because we have these, um, these uh, customer, you know, these customers had to happen to them. They'll have reviews, they'll have um, testimonials. And say, oh yeah, I was in your situation, and and this worked for me, and now I'm better. That um, when that does happen, that is one percent. Okay, so it can happen, but that bear in mind that's one percent. And whenever you go into that program a little bit more, you start to see that. And um, this is stuff that I've seen. I've had, um, I've known people who you've gone into it for for bare needs. Um, I I have done ventures at myself, and I know the same sales pitch. They all say, it. "If you become a truck driver, they'll spew it out to you." You know, if you want to be, uh, if you want to own your own business as a truck driver, they say, "Oh yeah, you can do this, and you can make a ton of money, and you can come home all the time." And, I, and that's a good good uh, example. Um, when I was working as an over the road truck driver, I started out um, with Prime. And Prime Trucking, is, they're a reefer company, so it's not Optimus Prime, it's actually Prime, Prime Rib, you know, because that's what he drove around, so that was what he named his truck company after. So, so this is Prime, Prime Inc., and um, I'm talking to a recruiter, I just, um, I just left a job before, and I was looking for a job that could get me significantly more money. I was making like... I went from making nine dollars an hour to a job that made sixteen dollars an hour, and they ran me into the ground. It was really, I ended up with walking pneumonia at that place, so that's that's why I ended up quitting. And I'm calling Brian because I'm trying to find something that pays well that's not gonna kill me, you know. And I'm talking to the recruiter, and he says, "Oh yeah, you know, we got people 
Um, we got lease operators that make six figures a year and they take one week off a month, you know? And I'm like, wow, that's awesome. You make six figures and you only work three uh, weeks a month. And that's perfect for me because at the time I was in the National Guard, I had to come home once a month. So I thought this is great, you know? So I, I decided to go for, and get my CDL and I start working for these guys. And when I got there, what I realized, I'm talking to my um, instructor, he's like, yeah, you know, you can you can go home, um, you can go home, you can space whatever schedule you want, you know, um, I don't do that, um, he comes home a little bit, but not a whole lot, you know, um, when I actually got my license and my CDL, and I started driving, what I, so it's over the road, so basically you go from one end of the country to all the way to the other, and you, you ship back and forth, and if you get the largest paying loads the ones in California going to the East Coast because East Coast is a there are a bunch of consumers so everything costs more because they produce little and they consume a lot right so things are more expensive over in in the Northeast I make it all the way over there um, but then I'd have to route my way back to Springfield in order to get that one week off that I promised my wife you know and what I found is my momentum would slow down as I routed back down to Springfield and then once I got back on the road my momentum slowly picked back up and I had this one week where it was awesome because it took me one week to pick back up momentum when I went out and then it, then I had fat I had momentum going but then another week I'd have to after two so I had one week of slowly picking back up one week of fast momentum going because I'm picking up loads and then I had to wrap myself back would slow down the momentum. And that's um, when I started getting the paychecks, that's when I realized that I was not going to make six figures with this with this math. Um, it wasn't going to happen. So the salesman said, you can work, you can make six figures and take a week off. What reality was, was you can work, you can make six figures or take a week off. You know, so he took, there are two worlds that the lease drivers were lived in. You know, the ones that took a week off did not make six figures. The ones that made six figures did not take a week off. But the salesman merged the two. He took the pros from both sides and spun them at me as if they were the same thing. You could do both, and it's not real. Now, um, honestly, and this is the harsh reality of the world, is... Prime's not the only one who does that. That's a, a common practice that salesmen do. And honestly, it's it's sleazy, you know, and you can hate me all you want, but it is sleazy. It's an unethical, it's it's um, uh, selling on false pretense, but it happens everywhere, you know, so bear that in mind. When a salesman is hired to sell a product, it means that that product is not widely desired or is not desired at the level that the company wants it to be sold because if you look at and it's usually excuse me it's usually high ticket items because you have to pay the salesman commission so that's the so that's that's a lot to do with it right so the salesman is incentivized to encourage people to sign up so um the 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 fewer people that that product applies to the more work the salesman has to do in order to get the product sold and why is this important if you're talking about business right why is josh talking about salesmen and these false promises and it's because of the pickaxe salesman i talk about the pickaxe salesman quite a bit so what they do what the pickaxe salesmen are they so back during the gold rushes um, the california gold rush and the uh, alaska gold rush the people that made the most money were uh, they weren't the ones that were actually digging for gold it was actually the people that sold the supplies they were the ones that that made the reliable income so you'd have a couple people that were digging for gold and they made they did well with whatever they found and then it would dry up um, i'm sure a small percentage of them made a lot of money but if you average it all out, most of them, you know, if you average out the income from the, the uh, miners, uh, the, the prospectors during those gold rushes, they didn't do very, they didn't do very well because um, you're playing against odds. You're playing against, you know, statistics. Um, 
people, uh, and and how what would happen is is people would go out there, uh, they would buy supplies, they'd go out into the woods, and they'd dig for gold. And the ones that got lucky, they they're the ones that made money. The ones that actually consistently made money were the ones that sold the pickaxes, the little um, you know troughs that they dumped the water into. To that they and they would sell those products and the and the canteens for you know whatever you know to these miners and they made the reliable income that's hap that that is a proven business model um today instead of just selling the pickaxe what people do is they they wrap the mining they wrap that effort into a business model and then they have training courses so what they'll do is they'll sell you the pickaxe but then they'll sell you the uh a course on how to use the pickaxe you know and so that's a lot of what's going on here. And I like to, one of these uh, pickaxe, modern pickaxe salesmen that I like to pick on, um, I like picking on the people who, who are on Amazon because it is such a widely um, popularized area to start up a business. So um, one of them is the e-commerce guy. Well, he, he has a business course that he sells people on how to build your Amazon store and be successful but it, who is making reliable income with this okay so on one end you have this guy who has this business model that he's selling he's selling this business model to you or maybe not to you personally but to his audience he's selling this business model to his audience his audience once they buy the business model they don't start making money until they actually sell other people whatever products that they post on Amazon. Sure, he has to he has to find customers, right? So he, he does have to find customers. But he's not in a very saturated market, at least right now. I haven't seen a whole lot. I've seen a couple of them selling business models for Amazon. So um, it will be more difficult for him to make money once his market becomes saturated. But the thing is, He's probably getting reliable income because he, as long as people use his model, he's selling a subscription to it. The people on Amazon, the people he's selling this model to, they build their stores on Amazon. They don't make any money until somebody buys a product from them. And even then they may not make money. If they use ads, they, they probably won't make money if they use ads to get people to go buy their thing. The idea here is to build up a reputation on the on in Amazon so that you get people to start coming to your store more regularly. The reality of it is is um, it's a, a high churn. These pickaxe salesmen have a relatively high churn rate, so people buy their product and then it doesn't work out for them. So then they 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 close up, right? But he's getting reliable income from the people who are paying for a subscription. Those people don't get money unless somebody buys a product multiple times. So, like, they he gets a subscription from all of his customers, all of his his audience that purchased. Nobody in his audience is selling subscriptions. Is that making so? Like, basically, he has reliable income here. They do not. So, he has he has less risk. He is minimizing the risk in his business. And they're taking, they're absorbing quite a bit of risk because they're paying for the ads. Um, at least McDonald's, McDonald's sells a franchise, but they do all the advertising. You know, all you have to do is is keep the store running, the restaurant running. You know, so with these models, you have to pay for your advertising, you have to pay for all the business costs, you have to pay to, you have to list the merchandise. Um, you're you're not you know, you'd be lucky if you break even you're barely scraping by really I really like to pick on um, This model it is successful. You can do it, but not as a job, you know, it's it's more um, It's more of like a side thing and you need a job to bring in reliable income while that something like an e-commerce store builds up You can be successful doing e-commerce um, the point I'm getting at is it's not your payday, you know. It's not going to get you um, millions of dollars right away. And that's why most people end up quitting because it doesn't meet the needs that they need right now. So then they never make it to the point where it actually can, or they burn a hole from doing a bunch of ads. Another one on Amazon that I saw that I actually 
Um, I saw a video on YouTube. It was a, a entrepreneur learn channel. Okay, and the guy, the guest, he's a, he's a guest. <laughs> uh, he's on there talking about he was making all kinds of money putting eBooks on Amazon. You know, he found this little niche, this little um, unknown area where you can just you can spend a couple hundred dollars and you could make thousands of dollars per book that you put on there and you only have to make it with like 10 pages you know he's like the, he's got these 10 page ebooks in order to uh make 500 dollars a month per ebook is what he says 500 dollars a month per ebook because the whole world is buying these ebooks on amazon and he of course he has a uh he has a subscription, and if you pay up, he will uh, show you how to do this. Now, in his free stuff, he walks you through posting a book on Amazon. And so, uh, I, I personally, I'm like, okay, you know, why, I'll just try this. Why, why am I going to pay for a subscription? I'll just try it and see. Make no mention of ads, by the way. So I do. I go. I go get. A, I build a, a couple ebooks and I put them on there onto Amazon and I send ads to one because, frankly, you're not getting. Um, whenever you list a new book on Amazon, it's on page um, 100 plus. I don't even know where it's at unless <laughs> unless you pay ads to get it on the top, right? Because there are what uh, he. He did mention niching down, but the reason you niche down is what, as he he did say, is because there are so many people on Amazon doing this, right? This isn't a new magical thing. Back in 2008 or 11, 2010, something like that, Amazon start they allowed people to self-publish, and so what people were doing was they were paying other people to write books and they'd put them on Amazon and people would read them um but nowadays that market is so saturated and the reason why it's so saturated is because guys like him are selling subscriptions to other people and you have to wonder if he is making 500 dollars a book why would he lure why would he get so many people to sign up and pay him to compete with him you know is he really doing that as a business right now? You know, unfortunately, now here's something that I realized with the um, the dating community. This may sound off topic. So there's this there's this um, guys there's a, there's a guy, a group of guys called pickup artists, and you may or may not have heard of them. There's a guy by the name of Neil Strauss who wrote a book on him. It's called The Game, and um, something else, but it's The Game by Neil Strauss. And he basically, he's a writer who, he infiltrated the secret pickup artist group and uh, he learned all their tactics. He learned um, the various tactics by the different styles of pickup artists. So what he did was he hung out with different ones and he picked up off of them and he kind of added to each, he, he, he took the parts that he liked and he used them. And he, what he realized is that people who were successful, they manipulated social dynamics, they manipulated um, um, features about the male that makes them attractive. So what they would do is they go to a nightclub and they would behave in ways that women found to be attractive. Now they go out in normal life when they're not in this, uh, this what I think they call it the frame. And they wouldn't be as a, they wouldn't have that same level of attractiveness, and the reason why is because um, it was all staged. You know, they planned. They had these. It's like um, it's like uh, the comedians. Yeah, the same. They they stood. What they they studied the structure that comedians use to tell jokes. You know, they have comedians have they developed a strategy to. Um, play on words right to make people laugh but they'd study the play on words and the play on behavior to get results and so they would have um, material and they would try and if it didn't work it like they'd come out with ten things and and eight didn't work but two did so those were the two that they kept and it went out again and 
and that time the first two worked um, but the, but seven didn't and then they had one that worked so they added that one now they have three things that they know that where they work and they do this every night out in different bars and nightclubs until they had a whole set of material that they would use on women to get those women to like them now and I thought well this kind of I didn't actually you know it's kind of it does it's not really it's like you you can't really maintain a long-term relationship with that kind of strategy because obviously you take them home and you're not the same person they would, they'll figure it out eventually but it's great to pick people up in the short term right so who cares if they don't stick around because that's not these people's goals you know that's that's what these that's the pickup artists do what does this have to do with starting up businesses um the this this behavior is what so these pickup artists are marketing themselves to women they're using psychology they're using human psychology to get women to like them so they're they're marketing themselves because this is how marketing works is you use human psychology to get your audience to like you in this case it's these pickup artists using material to pick up women so then um, marketers they use this material to pick up customers it's the same thing it's not just the pick up salesman it, widely in, in marketing it's it's done everywhere in marketing so what's the point that I'm getting at people are saying things just like with the pickup artist that guy is a, a dweeb you know but he goes into a nightclub and he looks like a hunk you did you know but it's all fake you know when you leave the nightclub he's a dweeb so um, so what happens in, in marketing with businesses is they will they will use human psychology to make their product look really really awesome as awesome as possible so as many people buy it as possible what does this have to do with starting a business um, you have to know that this is a thing in marketing that people use to get people to buy stuff because the business model salesman is the current you know I don't even know how how many billions dollars a year industry it is you know but it's it's a, a lot of people are doing this and a lot of people are selling a lot of money if you think about um, I like franchises so I don't really want to harp on them but they they're, they're the same thing they're probably the better of of these business model salesmen you know um, but you got all these guys on YouTube you got um, they're mainly on you they're on social media right now selling their business models to people who are hungry right so that's what you need to bear in mind I and I'm telling all these stories I spent 20 minutes talking about this because this is the bad stuff that I've seen right so that um, guy on Amazon who was selling a business model for ebooks I didn't buy his, his products so I didn't see a point I knew enough about the back end I knew I knew that in order to get a product to list I'd have to put ads out there right so I did that with a book you know and um, the result that I realized was there's no way to get a book to uh, profit at, at, I mean because Amazon selling your book for a cent a page you know something crazy like that with the Kindle Unlimited so you can't profit with that you know you're not profiting with that so um, he would even say you'd have to keep at it for two years so <laughs> in his um, preliminary uh, pre-training stuff the stuff that he uses to lure to get people to sign up he he said it takes two years to build up enough momentum where you have reliable income coming from these ebooks two years are you gonna get to the promise are you getting your goal if you're signing up so you can get money right now and he says oh by the way you won't get start getting money until two years but by the way you gotta pay me in order to have my information products what what are you doing you know you spend money on this for two years now if you actually stay the whole time and you figure everything out that he talks to you to, tells you to do and you actually stick to it then eventually sure yeah you probably will start making some income you know you'll start making some income but you're you're for two years you're digging yourself into a hole and um, then you start getting to the point where you start making some money and then 
how long is it going to take for you to break even? You know, are you, have you, um, for most people, because these products, and that's another thing I do want to emphasize, the, the, the business model salesmen, their products have a, a 10% success rate. 10, 20% success rate. So, uh, do you want to be the 80%? You know, they'll even say the results that they advertise are in the top 10%. They have to. It's legally required for them to to actually say that. They will advertise the crap. Marketing, what I say about the, the pickup pick up artist people, right? This is marketing. So they'll market, they'll advertise the top 10% what they do. And they say, well, all you got to do in order to be that successful is be the top 10%. That, that's all you got to do. You know, you got to be the top 10%. You have to, in this percentile, so you have to outcompete 90 people. For every one that's successful, 90 people have to, to not be as successful as you with this model. Is this something that you want to do? You know, that's something you'd have to ask yourself. And, and so that's really, that's really what I want to hit home. What I found is business models are actually, if you want to start a business, it's actually, it's actually, um, way less risky than doing something like that. Now, granted, if you buy this pickaxe model, uh, pickaxe salesman business model, you will uh, eventually you will learn something. No matter how long you're in it, you'll learn something. You know, because they're teaching you. You're going to have to actually try to get a business going. And that's going to teach you stuff, and they're going to give you information on what works and what doesn't. That's going to work. That's going to help you. Bear in mind, in order to be successful, you have to be one of the top 10%, you know? But if you want to learn how to start a business, they will teach you. What I've found is the biggest hurdle to starting a business is people overcomplicating it. And, and uh, uh, for example, marksmanship is the same way. Anything that you try to do, if people are not successful, it's because somebody overcomplicated it, you know? and that's everything is so overcomplicated these days and uh, i do i want to talk about marksmanship you know because that's an overcomplicated subject it's like well i'm not i don't have it in my blood you know i just can't do it um and that's that's really nothing there nothing is like that anything that one person can do chances are great that you you may not be as good as that person but you can still do it you still be very good at it you know um with marksmanship, there are really only four things, they call it the four fundamentals, that you have to know in order to reliably shoot. And that's, you have to have a steady aim, so when you have your, your rifle, um, I'll use a rifle because it's, one, it's the easier thing to shoot, so you'd have to have steady aim, so you can not uh, move around, you're not going to hit a target if you're doing this, you know, you, and uh, you're going to have to have uh, a sight picture, right, so you have so you have to line up your sight picture so you got two pieces you line them together and this is most weapons have a, a two-piece sight picture that you line together and then that that re those two things reduce the area where the bullet can go and then the next thing is breathing because when you're breathing you're going up and down up and down so you want to pause in a natural pause you want to find a natural pause when in your breathing and then the last thing is the trigger squeeze, and why that's important is because if you're quick, you'll jerk the trigger. But if you're slow and, and straight back, you don't jerk it. Those four things control the direction of the, of the rifle when you fire. Just those four things. If you control those four things, you will shoot reliably and accurately. And that's, that's the secret to marksman. That is that simple, you know? It's that simple. And it's the same thing with business. You just have to simplify all the crap, get, get rid of all the crap. You know, people will say, oh, you got to have a logo. You know, you got to have a business plan. If you want to start a business, you have to have to, you have to have a business plan in order to start a business. You can't go anywhere with it. I mean, that's what, um, I love them. Uh, Small Business Association. They, they do give out a lot of resources for, for uh, people trying to start small businesses or maintain small businesses. But they're all about the business plan, you know. And uh, think about it. You want to start up a business. And they say before you can even start up, you got to have a business plan. And these business plans are like 15 pages long. So you're going to spend how long planning your business? 
you know, you're going to you're going to build this 15 page business plan. It talks about your financials. It talks about what your product is, who, who you're selling it to, you know, all these different things. 15 pages long, and then you actually start operating your business. Now, if you've never operated this business before, how do you know what you plan is actually going to work? The marvels of modern bureaucracy is what it, this is an example of that. You don't know if whatever it is that you're trying to do is going to work. Even if you're trying to mow lawns, you don't know it's going to work. So you're going to write out a 15 page business plan to find out, oh, you know, um, the people in my area, I have to use a, a, a certain type of, of lawnmower because they have hills, and then the one that I had was going to flip over, and I spent 10 pages or 5 pages talking about the wrong lawnmower. You know, like, you, you, that, that's, you're going to waste a lot of time doing that. No, by the way, um, financials didn't turn out the way that I anticipated. I thought I'd make this dollar figure, and then it was all wrong. It threw off all my money. I have no idea. I mean, I can't. I'm not. I'm losing money now. But I spent two years planning a business, and then you know when I implemented it, it didn't work. You know, so <laughs> that's a little excessive. Um, so then, and then of course the website, because what business does not have a website? You see that all over, especially if you're on Facebook to talk about what business does has a website or does not have a website. It only real. Uh, if you if you want a real business, you have to have a website. And notice if you click on these people that are saying that, if you go to their pages on here or you go to their, wherever, their contact information, nine times out of ten, they're website designers. So, uh, yeah, of course they're going to say that. So what, what do you really need? Well, um, what I've found to be successful is to actually minimize the crap out of what you spend. You don't need a logo. All logos do is uh, this is something that I realized it does absolutely nothing the logo does absolutely nothing if you think of Target they have a logo right they have a very uh, iconic logo GE iconic logo um, uh, Michelin tires iconic logo but what does that logo really do what does it do when I if you see the logo you think of the of the company <clears throat> but what do you really think of when I think of Target, I think their stuff is uh, a hair better than Walmart. So that's what I think of. When I think of the little the Target icon, that's what I'm thinking of, the Target logo. When I'm thinking of Michelin tires, it's a guy on the side of the road. I, I may or may not have ever gone to a Michelin tires person, but if you have, then you're going to think of the good, you're going to think of something that, that experience that happened when you went there, right? What was the other example that I uh, I gave? Uh, Target, you know, Michelin guy. Um, oh well, but same thing. You're thinking of whatever that business is. You're thinking of whatever that experience was. Okay. For me, I'd never gone to a Michelin guy, but I remember seeing his store on the side of the road. So that logo, when I see that logo, it makes me think of that. If you are starting out with a business that's never done anything and you have a logo right what does that logo mean to people nothing they've never done anything with you they've never seen your business on the side of the road they don't know anything they don't know what to think of that it's just a picture logo is just a picture to people have never done business or never seen that business never heard of that business logo doesn't mean anything right so why spend, I don't know, if you, you, 50, let's say you can get a logo for 50 bucks, or you can spend eight hours and build one yourself. Why spend all that on a logo that means nothing to people? You know, um, that's just me. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's only, I mean, if you get a decent one for 50 bucks, that's great, but that's $50 you didn't have to spend because you don't even know if whatever you're trying to sell actually sells, right? Um, the business card, same way. What's a business card for? It's something to give somebody in a formal area. Um, they're actually going to the wayside. You can sit them at a gas station. You can pin them to walls or something. But that's pretty archaic. Archaic processes, very slow. You can you can post on the internet, but you don't need a website in order to get your contact information on the internet. <laughs> 
So that's that's what my ne next thing. Website. You're going to spend. Uh, let's say you spend twelve hundred dollars to get a fancy website. I've seen the numbers as high as four thousand. Right. Um, hopefully by now you're actually making money with your business. Otherwise, if you spend fifteen hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars on a website, a fully functional website, it's got all the bells and whistles, got contact page, got this, got that, got everything, and you're not making money. What are you doing? You know, if your business isn't making money, why do you have a website? It's like the uh, the name of star people, right? You remember when I was a kid, you'd hear on the TV, you know, you could name a star after yourself or a loved one. You could, for like, I don't know, it was like 40 bucks, you could um, call in and, you, you know, you pay your 40 bucks and then they, they have a star they pick out and then you can name it after someone and then they'll send you information on that star, where it is, how you can find it in the sky. You're the only person that knows that, you know. There's, yeah, they have this national star registry. Who, who on a weekend says, "Hey, man, I'm bored. Uh, what do you want to do? I don't know. Let's go to the star registry and read, read on up on stars that's been named after people." I mean, I'm not trying to harp. I mean, maybe, maybe you, you did that. It's kind of romantic if you got like a girlfriend or something. And you're like a, in your early twenties, you know. But other than that, it's cheesy, you know. And that's the point I'm getting at. It's really cheesy. And you got a website. You're gonna spend a lot of money. It's not even forty bucks. It's it's thousand dollars to get a website all fancy, and uh, very few people are actually gonna know about it. Why are you wasting your money if you don't actually have a product, right? So this is a lot of the back end stuff, and uh, that's what I've noticed is we will work on the back end stuff for our business way before we actually get the front end stuff. You know, a business plan is is a back end thing. Small Business Association is all about building a business plan if you want to start a business. That's dumb. On it, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you right now, it's dumb to write out. Even if it's five pages, it's still dumb because you don't know if it's going to succeed. So why are you spending five, you know, all your time writing up a business plan? You don't even know if that plan is going to work. So what What do you do? You know, um, Simple. You know, um, Another thing that I noticed where, uh, where people mess up is we will, and I mean, we're all um, culprits of this. We will start with, uh, as human beings, we are very egocentric, even as adults. Uh, kids are very egocentric, and then we, and when we grow up and we develop, we become less egocentric, and hopefully we're mature enough to develop empathy, and hopefully if you're trying to start a business, you, you know what the word empathy means because you're going to need it. Um, and that's a good point I want to hit on real quick is if you're trying to start up a business just to make a lot of money it's not empathetic it's not empathetic now why is empathy important because in order for in order you think about it when you give somebody money what are you doing are you thinking oh man I feel bad you, okay so maybe you saw some a homeless person on the street and you you throw them five bucks because you feel bad for them right or recently with this pandemic, uh, the news has been talking about small businesses failing. So you, you might feel like, oh man, maybe I, I spent 20 bucks in a small business store because, because I, I feel bad. 90% of the time, that's not you don't spend money because you feel bad for somebody. You're spending money because you need something, right? You want something. You're exchanging money for something that you want that's valuable to you. Well, everybody is that way. You're no different. Everybody is that way. So if you want to start a business, you really want to start with, and the first item that you want to start with is a want, a current want in the market. And you have to see it as a want, not a need, as a want. People need what they want. They don't always want what they need, but they need what they want. And they buy what they want. And that's not what anyone talks about. I mean, they kind of do. You hear it once in a while. Now that I know to listen for it, I hear it more lately. But, you know, a couple years ago, I, I didn't, this concept was alien to me. But it is nonetheless, it, the most important thing that I could relay right now is if you're going to get into business with something, it has to be something people want. You have to start with a want. Um, if you're selling... If you're selling um, um, on an e-commerce store, you know, let's say if you're selling, you want to start an e-commerce store, start with a market 
where people want stuff, okay? So to make that easier, what you'd want to do is you'd pick a population. You pick a group of people that all want the same things. So let's say your, your population is going to be moms. So you're going to pick a want of theirs. What's something that, that I would say? You'd want to pick something that all moms want, maybe something most moms want. Um, most moms, vast majority of them, even if their kids are older than two, want wipes, you know. You know, they have diapers or, or they clean up faces and stuff with wipes. So that is very popular. They don't necessarily need wipes, you know. They may justify, yeah, I need wipes. What if your kid isn't in diapers anymore? What do you need wipes for? Who cares? They want them, right? So that's something that they want. Right, you identify what they want, and then you make that thing accessible. So if you have, if if you know that they want wipes, you're gonna make it, it those wipes accessible to them. Now, in a in a perfect world, in our example, nobody right now is making wipes accessible. So then you create a place for them to get the wipes, and that's where you have the greatest advantage to make a lot of money. If you're the only person providing this, if there's a hundred people providing it, then you have to compete. Uh, you know with those hundreds of people right but for our example let's say you're the only person who's realized that moms want wipes so you make it available or they want wipes but it's very difficult for them to get to so you make it easier for them to get to that's something that's more realistic so uh so a whole bunch of moms want wipes you make it easy easier than what it is currently for them to get it so then they demand your wipes um, now that you actually, so what you're doing here, you made the wipes accessible and they actually, they want them. So this confirms that they want them. You don't actually know what they want. Even if you talk to them, you don't know what they want until you make it available to them and they buy it. So this is, this is step three. First step, you start with a want. Second step, and what they want is wipes. The second step is you make it accessible to them in a small amount. Why did I pick a small amount? Let's say, um, let's say it's not wipes that you pick. For the, you know, let's say you pick um, breast pumps, you know, and um, you make a thousand breast pumps accessible to all these moms, and they don't buy because they don't actually want them. How would you know that until you actually have a consistent sales history to say what their demand is? How do you, you know, you don't know whether or not they actually want it. You can believe they want it. Let's say you talk to moms and, and they say, yeah, you know, I really, um, yeah, I, I want, you know, I plan on breastfeeding my kids. So a breast pump would be great. And then six months later, you make the breast pump available and lo and behold, they don't breastfeed their kids. You know, something happens, life happens, um, breastfeeding is hard, you know, whatever the case may be, they don't do it. So now you don't have those customers. So then you created that product, you made it available in large quantities, and they didn't actually want it. So then you make it, you make it accessible to them in small, small enough quantities uh, that it doesn't kill you. Because I'm assuming you don't have a whole lot of money to dump on business ventures, right? So you don't want, you want to test the theory because it's all about establishing. Uh, you establish a theory, people want this product, you make it available, you, this is testing the theory, and then, you know, they confirm your theory by paying for it. That develops a sales history. Once you do that, you scale. Now, uh, in order to scale, you have to remove all, un, uh, as many unknowns as possible. You're not going to remove all of them, but as many unknowns as possible. Let's go with, um, let's go back to the wipes. Now, um, let's say what's what how many variables can we um, with let's say you, now if you didn't test it so this is what I'm talking about with variables if you didn't test your theory or your hypothesis if, you, if you, for all you scientists out there if you didn't test it and um, you didn't confirm that people actually pay for the product that you list then you can put it out in mass you know and let's, you, you don't scale, you just go full blast, you know, and you make 10,000 available, you dump a bunch of money on a website that sells this product, and then nobody buys, you know, so you just wasted a bunch of money. So that's what this step is. Now, um, you want to eliminate as many unknowns as possible. That's why you, that's why I recommend starting small. So you, and you don't even have to start out online. Um, 
you can go to a neighborhood. You can go to a suburb, uh, yeah, suburban, uh, suburbia, and you can te you can see how many will, will buy the product that you have. Um, you can for the moms because moms live in suburbia, right? So you can go out there and and you can try to sell them on what you think they'll actually buy. You can test that they will buy it. You can actually um, you can go out and consistently go out to areas for like six weeks build up a sales history and you can talk to let's say you talk to a hundred moms and 30 of them buy your wipes one of them bought your breast pumps so okay you know um, I got a better idea of uh, the percent the demand for my products so maybe now if you want to scale it you know what to focus on right so that, that's really that's way way simpler than um, what a lot of people out there what they'll do is they'll try to sell people on their business model and they want to convince you that they're uh, the answer to whatever your problems are and that's not necessarily the case because let's say you're trying to do some you have a pursuit that you're trying to do and you've been working so hard but there's just something that you're missing you know and uh, so you go research, let's say you're trying to get more traffic to your website. Well then um, you run into somebody who sees you have traffic problem and they want to sell you a different product to sell on your website and say, no, 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 that, then, you know, that's not what I need. What I need is to solve this problem here, right? And that's what's, what's gonna happen in, in, when you run into these hurdles is, and you go researching, a lot of these people will do that because they got a product to sell and you're close to fitting their niche so they think that they can try to you know hook you in and sell you whatever they have and maybe even completely change your direction right and you don't want to do that you have a fixed goal that you have in mind this is basically the model this is how you do it this is how you break it down you just simplify it simplify it uh, you just cut out all the extra crap you don't need a business plan uh, you're testing the, 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 the business theory, right? You're testing your theory that you have a, a need in the market. You know, they should, they should really call it a want in the market because it's not a need in the market. People don't buy what they need, they buy what they want. And what I like saying to hit this concept home is McDonald's is proof of that. Nobody needs McDonald's, but everybody wants it, right? That they, their sales prove that. You don't, nobody needs McDonald's. People don't buy what they need, they buy what they want. So you have to establish a want in the market. And once you establish that want, you make it, you know, the only way to truly establish it is a sales history. So you you decide you believe, so you have a belief that there's a want in the market. And then you test that, you know, you test it. And then they will confirm by paying you. You don't have to build a $4,000 website in order to test the market. You don't have to build a 15-page business model in order to test the market. Let's say you mow lawns, right? You go to the uh, Small Business Association, they're going to tell you to come back with a 15-page business plan, and then we'll help you on the next step. What? You know, all you have to do is go out and talk to people and see if they'll let you cut their grass, you know? So, okay, so here's why Small Business Association likes business plans, just so you know. The reason why is because banks want to know that you're a legitimate business if they're going to loan you money you know which why who's going to fault that you know they don't want to dump money into something that's not going anywhere unless <laughs> uh unless it's the current um current banking system and with large corporations but uh, all that aside with the typical average joe because let's face it there's a million different people with I mean I've heard one person say that everybody has a business idea in their minds that they're walking around with it within their minds you know how many of them are actually going to launch a successful business right so banks don't want to loan that they don't want to loan based on that so what they want is if you're trying to sell them on your business they want to know that your business is not gonna fail and that's what the business model that's what the business plan does is it just writes out your business it just writes out your business model and basically if you want if you really have to have a business plan all you have to do is write down um, 
where the revenue is coming from, how you know it's coming from there, where it ends up, how much you keep, right? And then the bank wants to know what you're going to do with that money, how it's going to get paid back. And that's what the business plan is supposed to tell the bank. You need to know that if you're going to write a business plan. That's all it's for. You should not be borrowing money on a, for a business that's not proven yet. How do you prove it? You do these four steps. You do those four steps. You establish a want in the market. You test your theory that that want is legitimate by making it accessible. And in, in a small amount, um, small enough to where you can make it accessible without killing your pocketbook. And then um, if, if that customer base actually wants the product that you think they want, they will pay for it. You know? Um, everything will move. Everything on any market will move at the right price. And how this can be illustrated is in real estate. So you have um, houses that get put on the market and and you have some that move like instantly, like a couple days. And you have others that, you know, been on the market for two years. And I'm not exaggerating. There are some circumstances where they'll sit on the market for two years. Why isn't the house moving? You know, it's because nobody wants it at that price if if that seller were to lower the price to a certain level to a point where people will actually pay for it it will go away it that's how supply and demand works so that's that's what you learn here you learn um the wants that you know you learn that if people want it at the price that you're listed they will pay for it so if you have a product available uh, let's go back to the diapers. Let's say you charge for a little 20 pack of diapers. You, you charge it, you know, 50 bucks. You know, are those people going to pay for it? You know, if they can go, it's about how the, it, it's about what's in it for them, whether or not they're going to pay for it. You know, in modern world, if you're going to charge $50 for a little canister of wipes, they're just going to drive. They'll, they'll, they won't buy it from you. Not if it's if it's worth it for them to get it from a competitor. If they really, really have to have that something that you have, they can't get anywhere else for a better price where they don't have to put that level of commitment to it, then yeah, they'll pay whatever price that you have. That's how the supply and demand works in the market. You figure that out by testing it. So whatever it is that you try to sell, you can bring it down to your break-even point. If they still don't buy it, they don't want it. They don't want it at the price that you're selling it for. You know, so then you re-evaluate. But that's how you do this. That's how you um, test a business model and get it proven and you're actually selling stuff. Now obviously you don't want to stay break, broke, uh, at a break-even point. You want to increase to where you're actually pocketing some money. But that's a tool you can use. That I mean, if you're at the point and you're breaking even, and nobody's buying it, then you know it's, that's not a viable product. You know, it's people don't want it for the price that you're selling it for. That's what. That's how you start a business. Honestly, those four steps. You start out with those four steps, and then you build systems around getting those steps going. You know, and hopefully that makes sense. Um, that's basically the whole, the gist of the topic that I have here today. And, and I hope, um, I hope you get something out of it. Um, good luck with your business. I'll talk to you soon.